Well, but no, it's paid. No, we're for talking this about. Month. We're not talking about that. We're talking about if you were to delete the. Ohio, he still has a house down in Clinton, and then uh, he goes back and forth. Are they still together? Or? Oh, yeah. And Arnie called me up. He goes, hey, you gotta come out and look at this thing. I'm like, oh, really? I was thinking, you know, it had a broken subframe or something like that. He said, no. He says, the ball joint, gone. I can, I'll, I, I. Well, no, it's paid. No, we're talking about, we're not talking about that. We're talking about if you were to delete the account. Ohio, he still has a house down in Clinton, and then uh, he goes back and forth. Are they still together? Or? Oh, yeah. And Arnie called me up. He goes, hey, you gotta come out and look at this thing. I'm like, oh, really? I was thinking, you know, it had a broken subframe or something like that. He said, no. He says, the ball joint, gone. I can, I'll, I, I. Well, no, it's paid. No, we're talking about, we're not talking about that. We're talking about if you were to delete the I he still has a house down in Clinton, and then uh, he goes back and forth. Are they still together? Or? Oh, yeah. And Arnie called me up. He goes, hey, you gotta come out and look at this thing. I'm like, oh, really? I was thinking, you know, it had a broken subframe or something like that. He said, no. He says, the ball joint, gone. I can, I'll, I... Yeah. Next is Jim Pace. Jim Pace is my mother's boyfriend. This guy was in our family for going on 12 years and then proved to be one of the most dangerous people that I know due to his position in our family. My mom began to go out with him in the year 2001. He worked at the same high school as she did. She's an English teacher and I believe that she said that Jim Pace worked in the in-school suspension room. Then they moved to California together around 2008. My mom wanted to return there because that was where she grew up and she wanted to be close to our family out there. They bought a house together and then Jim retired and my mother taught school in California. In his retirement, Jim Pace had no interest or pastimes. My mother would often complain that Jim was a tough person to live with because he was always hyperactive, yet never had anything to do, and complained about being bored, but would never attempt to involve himself in doing anything to pass the time. She said that he would not even help with yard work. Oftentimes, when people retire, they develop interest or take up something that they have always wanted to do, yet had never had the time. Yet Jim Pace had no interest whatsoever. Since at that time I lived in Connecticut with my wife named Rachel, I did not spend a lot of time with Jim. I just saw him when I went to visit my mother. From what I remember, he was always very quiet. He cooked a little bit and prepared some Italian food that was pretty good. Yet he always looked down when we sat at the table and never had much to say. So he didn't make it too easy to get to know him. He never joked around or told any stories about himself, though he said that he grew up in Queens, New York. I just regarded him as a very quiet and boring guy. I was always very polite to Jim and considered him a nervous guy who did not know what to do with himself. So I did feel kind of sympathetic towards him. Sometimes when I'll call my mom, she will complain that Jim would ruin their day trips. They would plan something out and then they would drive an hour or two to get to that location. And then as soon as they arrived, Jim would complain and say that he wanted to go right back home. He would complain that he did not feel well and he needed to go right back home. And she said that he would do this almost every time they took a trip someplace. And it seemed that he did this on purpose to cause problems. When I heard this, I thought that she may be exaggerating a little bit. 
in 2014, I was having trouble finding work. So I decided that it may be a good idea to get a used pickup truck and then go around and find work on my own. So I told my mother about this plan over the phone and she agreed to help me finance a truck. So Jim overheard our conversation and said to her that it would be a perfect time for him to fly out so he could see his family in Connecticut and then help me drive around to find a new truck. There were quite a few large auto parks in the area, but there was still a half hour or so to get to. And at that time, I got around by bus or I just walked. So I needed help getting around to find a truck. So I said that was a great idea and I thanked them both. So Jim had a brother and sister who lived in Connecticut. So the plan was for him to fly out and then he would stay at his sister's house for a few days to catch up with them. And then he would call me and let me know when we could go out looking for a truck. So when the day came, we agreed to meet at a shopping plaza down the street from my apartment. So I walked down there and he showed up driving his sister's car. And at that point, we drove from Waterbury, Connecticut to where there are some car dealerships, I believe in the town of Southbury. When we arrived at the auto park, as soon as we got there, he said he did not feel well and he had to go back to his sister's house to lie down. I am not exaggerating in the least. After one minute, he insisted that we leave. So I looked at him and I said, why don't you go into the car dealership, into the waiting room and get a cup of coffee and sit down if you're not feeling well or just hang out in the car for a little bit. But since we drove all the way out here, let me at least walk around to where they have the used trucks and note some of the information down. And he said, I just can't do it. I have to leave now. I want to say that when he said this, he was smiling a little bit. He did not look nervous. He did not look sick. He looked like he was doing this on purpose. So I was a little bit confused at the time, but I did not make a big deal about it. And he dropped me back off at my apartment. So I called him in a day or two, and then again in a week. And every time Jim said he could not do it because he was still too sick to drive me around to help me find a truck. So at the time, I thought that Jim may be having psychiatric problems, like severe anxiety problems. So I did not want to give him a hard time. So I just called my mom and I told her what was happening. And she did sound a little bit surprised, but reminded me that this is what Jim did all the time to her. So I told her that my only option was to take the bus or walk to the small dealerships around Waterbury. And I was not too happy about it because I had been kind of looking at these places and they look run down and didn't have too much of a selection. However, I managed to find a small GMC truck at one of the small car lots in Waterbury. So around this time, I believe that they ended up selling their house. My mother really never got along too well with Jim for all of these reasons. So she bought a condo in California. So after they sold the house and split the money, Jim would stay in California at my mother's condo during some of the winter months, but then return to Connecticut for the spring and summer. So starting in the winter of 2015, I began to drive into the state of New Hampshire to look for houses to buy so that I could be close to my daughters. I had saved up about 12 grand and my mother and I financed the house in New Hampshire and I moved in in the summer of 2015. And then every summer, my mother and brother would fly out from California to stay in New Hampshire with me. Since Jim lived in Danbury, Connecticut, he would also come visit for a week or two, but would not stay for the whole time that she was here. In 2017, Jim stayed at this house for a week or two and did a number of insane things. First, that summer, it had started raining in New Hampshire for about a week and it got very cold. So one day, my mother suggested that we go out to a few stores or go see a movie, but Jim said that he was too sick to go with us and he wanted to stay back at the house. So when we returned later that afternoon, it was cold out and my mother asked me to turn on the heat. And when I did, the furnace turned on for a second and then shut back off. So I went downstairs and saw that the flame, the pilot light in the furnace wasn't coming on. 
So I looked and saw that somebody, like Jim, had turned off the fuel valve by just turning this dial. Now right before they arrived, I turned the furnace on and it worked fine. So for those of you who do not know too much about furnaces, if you mess with the fuel line, you're going to get air pockets in the fuel line, in this copper fuel line, and it will cause the furnace to malfunction and it will not heat the house. So if this happens, there is a process called bleeding the fuel line or getting rid of the air pockets before you turn back on the furnace. So you have to take off the front panel and then you loosen this nozzle and you let the fuel pour out into a container and this will clear the fuel line of any air pockets. So it's not that hard to do. It's just something that most people do not know how to do. And if my mom saw me doing this, it may start an argument. She'll want to know what I'm doing to the furnace and why I'm not calling a furnace guy to do this. So this was something that Jim had done to attempt to provoke a problem between my mother and I. So I asked my brother if he could make up an excuse and get them out of the house for a while so that I could do this. So they went out to get something to eat and I cleared the fuel line, I turned the furnace back on and it worked fine. So when they all returned, I didn't say anything, but I realized that he had done this most likely because he was part of the military's secret society and he was doing little things hoping to cause some tension or arguments in the house. I thought if this was as bad as it gets, I really have nothing to complain about. So at this time, I believed that some of these people who were chosen to be part of the military secret society were not as bad as others. I can tell you now that nothing is further from the truth. The guys chosen to get close to you are the worst guys they have. And there are no good guys chosen to work in the military society. There are only those who are better at hiding what they really are. The ones that can look you right in the eye, that can act like you're their friend, that can sit down and share meals with you, and then the next day stab you right in the back, have to be a special type of human scum. Everyone chosen for these military secret societies are people who have been programmed by the military and have multi-personality disorder. And deep down, they have nothing but hate for people that are not part of their military societies. Their loyalties will always lie with the military secret society and never with any family that they are employed to get close to, monitor, and then sabotage and kill. There's a part of them that not only likes this process, they need this process. It makes them feel good to do this. It benefits them. They have a lot to gain by hurting and killing those they're employed to get close to. This gives them top marks in their society. This gives them more money, promotions. They have everything to gain by stabbing regular people like you and your families in the back. And the act of getting close to regular people and pretending that they love, respect, and admire you, while all along, the only thing they want to do is to hurt and kill you, is called the flower of life. So at the time, I did not realize the level that he was involved in and the extremes that he would go to to hurt and kill me and my family. Everybody must understand that the enemy of militaries and empires has always been families. That has always been the enemy of the military cult. So when Jim tampered with the furnace, I thought that this is what he came up with to cause my mother and I to argue and to get into a big fight because all along my mother is one of the only people who have stuck by me and helped me through all this harassment one of the only people that I could count on was my mother and they knew this so they ordered Jim to attempt to cause some strife between my mother and I and she had had a history of furnaces malfunctioning and she was a little bit nervous around furnaces. So they knew that if I began working on the furnace and she came down and saw that, that could get us to argue. That could potentially cause a big fight. So in my mind, 
I considered the fact that Jen had been ordered to do this, and it could have been worse. So I would just have to tolerate the military's tactics through Jen and act like it did not really bother me. So I just ignored what Jim had done and the way Jim was acting and continued to try to act cool to him and remain in a positive mental state. So by doing this, I thought that it would earn Jim's respect. My understanding that he was part of the military society and was required to do at the very least things like this, which I would have to be on guard of, but not lose my self-control. I thought that would be enough for men like Jim. When the rain had passed and it began to get nice again, my brother and I got back to work on installing the fence that had begun to fall over in our yard. So we took the entire section of fencing down, we bought a dozen new fence posts and went to work putting up one section of fence at a time. So we worked at it for about a week and we're approaching the last fence section. So we had dug two holes, and I believe that we put in one post, but then my mother called out the window that my brother and I should stop working because she wanted to go pick up her granddaughters and then go someplace for the day. So I believe that we had one fence post in, it was drying in concrete, and we had one hole that was dug waiting for the next post. Besides that, the whole area was raked up and everything was very neat because there was only limited space to work in and I didn't want anybody tripping or falling down. And the reason I tell you this is because the next day when I walked out there to take a look, I noticed this little red bone and it looked like a raccoon bone. And it stood out because it was slightly red. The dirt in the area was a darker brown, but this bone look red. Now, I had studied raccoon bones about a year before and I did this to compare raccoon bones to a tiny bone I found that looked human. And I have this process documented on this channel called Humorous Bone Update Hamilton Park that was uploaded January 26th, 2016. And there is a preceding video entitled Human Bone Found at Hamilton Park, Waterbury, Connecticut. So you can check those videos out. So, in the summer of 2017, a red colored raccoon bone is thrown in an area where I am working to install fence. So at the time, I noticed that it resembled a raccoon bone. However, I did not think too much about it. I guessed that we may have dug it up and I just took it and I placed it on this garden wall and I went back to work. So my brother and I put up the last section of fence. The fence had never been painted so we had to sand some parts away before painting the whole fence. So we were working on that and a day or two later I go out one morning and see that two more bones are lying on the ground and they stand out again because they are a slightly reddish color. So I realized that these were definitely not there the day before. So someone was in fact placing them there so that I would notice them. So I picked them up and then looked for the one I found the other day and saw that that was there too. And I guessed it may have been my neighbor who had walked across the yard and placed the bones where I was working to kind of mess with me. And at that time, I really did not even consider that it was Jim Pace who may have been doing this. I thought that probably it was my neighbor right over there. So at the time, I really didn't even consider that Jim Pace had done this. But now I believe that it was him. Another bone appeared a day or two later, and it appeared to be some type of pelvis bone. So I observed that the four bones were all the same reddish color. So I guessed that they may have been buried in a reddish dirt somewhere. So I placed these in plastic bags, and I did not say anything to my family. 
understanding that this may have been a tactic to inspire some sort of argument or weird feelings in the house. So I just put these bones into plastic bags and I put them into the shed and I didn't say anything to anyone about them. So it was around that time that Jim played another prank on me that involved putting something into my work boots that stunk like urine. So when I took my boots off after working one day, all I could smell was urine. And the smell was in the boots, the smell was on my socks. So I took the boots and I soaked them in a bucket of water with some clothes detergent overnight. And then I washed them off and let them dry. And after I did all that, they still carried that same smell. So I threw the boots away. So again, I decided that it was best not to bring any of this up. Jim was about ready to leave, and then I would not have to see him for a whole other year. So I just didn't say anything. If I were to blame Jim for some or all of this, it would most likely trigger my mother to defend him, and this would start a fight. Because what regular people will do is they'll play the role of a moderator or they'll defend whoever is accused in attempts to keep the peace. So if you begin accusing somebody like Jim for all these weird things happening, it puts him on the defensive and causes you to be the aggressor who is attacking him. And so regular people will look over at this little pathetic man sitting there being attacked and they will come to his aid in attempts to keep the peace. It's just what regular people do. So it's best not to bring up every little thing that goes wrong because that is a tactic the military uses to create a situation where you become somebody who wants to blame every little thing that goes wrong on a certain party because for some reason you just don't like this poor pathetic retard over here and aren't you being mean to them. So after Jim left, I found a couple of other things that Jim had done here. This included the smell of urine in the cooking oil and something else that is very disgusting as well. But the soap bar in the shower literally smelled like crap. It smelled like feces. It had been used to the point that it was about half the original size. And when I went to use it, the bar of soap smelled like it had been up somebody's rear end. So like I said, Jim had been here for about a week and then had left. And my mother and brother stayed at the house for about another month. And then she left at the end of summer. So about a week later, around the start of September of 2017, my mother calls me from California and she says at some point in the conversation, she asks if I am upset with Jim. And I tell her no and ask her why would she think that. And she says, because he keeps on calling from Connecticut and asking if you were upset with him because he has a weird feeling that you are. So I decided again to wait and not bring anything up that had happened here. So I guessed again that he was trying to provoke an argument or cause me to talk about some of the things that happened here during his stay because they had something planned out. So I just told her that no, I'm not mad at him. So I just told her that no, I'm not mad at him. So around that same time, Jim called on the phone and left a message on the answering machine, but I did not call him back. This is the last time he called me. It was in the fall of 2017. And this is a recording of that voice message. 14.2 p.m. Hey John, how you doing? This is Jim, just wondering how you were doing. Uh, you know, give me a call if you get a chance. 
So a few days later, I'm talking to my mom and she asked me if I received anything from Jim in the mail. And I told her no. So I've known Jim for over 10 years at that point and Jim had never sent anything to me, ever. So I did not know what he was up to. But my mother would continuously ask if anything came in the mail from him, but nothing did. She finally says that Jim had sent a card with a gift certificate in there and that he was going to send another one because obviously it had been lost in the mail. And I tell her, okay. So a few days later, I received a birthday card from Jim with a gift certificate to Home Depot for 50 bucks. So I went out that day and I bought him a thank you card. And I went to Walmart and I bought two expensive bars of guest soap and a brown soap dish. And I wrapped that up and I sent it to him. And the next time when I spoke to my mom, I told her that I got his card and I sent him a thank you card and a gift in return. So I know this may sound tedious, but I'm gonna explain what they're trying to do so you can understand all these tiny tactics they use to create strife between you and other people in your family. So what they wanted to have happened was for my mom to say, Jim thinks you're mad. Are you mad at him for some reason? And I would say, why is he asking that? Because he tampered with the furnace? Because he put piss in my work boots? Because he did something disgusting to the bar of soap? And then she could say, what are you talking about? Why are you saying all these things? Jim just wants to know if you're mad at him because you never said thank you for his little present he said on your birthday. So don't you sound weird. So I have discovered that it's best to wait for a good opportunity before you bring these things up. And usually that opportunity is if there's some problem happening with that person already. If they're in the mood to complain about that person, that sounds like the best opportunity to say, yeah, I agree with you. And while we're on that subject, while you brought it up, let me tell you what happened here. And then they'll be more receptive to the news. So nothing is brought up about Jim for about two months. And then it's around the end of November of 2017. And I'm talking to her on the phone and she brings up Jim and is complaining about him a little bit. And she says something about pranks being pulled on her. But she does not know if it's Jim or my cousin, her sister's son named Nick. Because some of these pranks happen when her sister and her nephew are visiting. And she says something about her internet being screwed with and also her pool. She had a small pool in the backyard and someone had messed with the heating system so the heater broke and the pool could not be heated. And then she said that things would happen like she would start her car and everything would be on full blast. The heater, the radio, the lights, the wipers, the hazard lights are on. So it's like something that a kid would do but she brings up the fact that some of this would happen when only Jim is around too. So I thought that it was a good time to bring up what happened here over the summer when Jim visited. And I told her about the furnace, someone messing with the furnace, and someone putting urine in my work boots. I left everything else out so the attention would only be on those two things. So she listened and then she said, I really don't think that Jim would do something like that. And she began to make excuses for Jim, saying that Jim did not know anything about furnaces, and my boots smelled like that, probably due to sweat. So at that point, I realized that going out of my way to convince her would begin to sound irrational. And I said that if we had a dog, I would think that the dog peed on the boots, and the smell was unmistakably urine. But again, when things like this happen, it is a person's defense mechanism to find a reasonable excuse because in their minds, it relaxes a stressful situation and balances things out. But it is very annoying when these things are happening to you and people act this way. But again, this is what secret societies have learned to do to harass people so they end up sounding paranoid and weird while their agents sit there and play dumb, looking hurt,
confused, and pathetic while they're being blamed for everything that is going wrong. Everybody goes to defend the agent and consider you the person that is being aggressive and is blaming this person for everything that goes wrong. It is you that's going to be considered out of line. It is going to be you who is considered somebody who is going out of their way to cause problems. And that is part of their passive, aggressive, psychological tactics that they will use against you and your family. So Jim was welcomed back into my house in the summer of 2018. So right before, Jim had had uh, hip surgery. He said he had hip replacement surgery. And he told everybody he wasn't feeling well. He felt good enough to drive all the way up here. But whenever we left to go out somewhere, Jim just could not work up any more energy to leave because he was just too sick to go anywhere. So basically, Jim wanted to have all the alone time he possibly could in the house. So he managed to drive up here with my mom and my brother, but he wouldn't leave anywhere. He wanted to stay at the house as often as he could. So two more pranks happened during the summer of 2018. And one was pretty bad and involved a phone charger. So I had a wall outlet phone charger and I could also use this charger in my minivan because they had an outlet, a regular outlet in the back of the van so that people could plug in TVs or whatever electrical components they wanted to plug in. And that was how I charged my phone. So toward the end of his stay, my mother insisted that Jim go with us instead of staying back home all the time. And so we drove into Brattleboro, Vermont, which is about a half hour drive away from us. And our plan was to go to a camping outlet. It was a hunting, fishing, outdoor sports, and camping outlet. So we walked inside and we we're looking at the chicken coops. And they had a bunch of baby chicks and a wooden pen in one of the aisles. So Jim walked over and said he was too tired to stand in the store. So he had to go sit down in the van. So I gave him the car keys and he went out to the van while we stayed in the store for another half hour or so. So when we got back to the house, I noticed that I had left my phone charger and it was plugged in right where Jim was sitting. So I bring the phone charger in to charge my phone. So I plug it into the wall and later that night when I go to unplug it, the phone charger falls apart in my hand. As you can see, the charger appears to have been cut perfectly along one side so that this piece of plastic comes right out like a panel. It looks like it's been cut that way on purpose so that the charger appears fine when you look at it, but when you go to unplug it from the wall, it falls apart easily in your hand. So I'm guessing that it's possible to get an electric shock from something like this. So I've never had any problem with this phone charger. But then Jim Pace goes and sits in the van for a half hour or an hour right next to the charger. And the next time I use it, it's sabotaged in this manner. So Jim stays for about a week or two. My mom and my brother would drive back with Jim into Danbury to stay at his condo just to hang out in Connecticut for a while. So I stay behind in New Hampshire and that night when I take a shower, I go to use the brush, the back brush, and it stinks like it's been used to scrub grease off of pots and pans. It smells like bacon grease. So in the summer of 2018, after my mother and brother visit here, our plan was to take my two daughters and fly to California for about a month and visit out there. So we spend about five weeks in California and then my daughters and I fly back. My ex-wife Rachel picks us up at Bradley Airport and she drives us back to New Hampshire. So when I get back, I notice that there is a white mold all over this dark colored couch I had in the living room. It really stands out. So I noticed this white mold has also gotten on this white and green carpet. It's also gotten on my other couch and it's gotten all over the curtains. 
It's basically gotten on everything in the living room. And then I notice in one of my daughter's room that there is this same white mold grown all over her closet where there's a stack of blankets. So I begin to take the blankets down to wash everything and I see that someone has taken a pillow and has poured something on the pillow so that there is this huge stain in the middle of it and then for some reason they've hidden it behind the stack of blankets in the closet. So this pillow has the most concentration of mold on it and the mold looks white and green in places. Now the dark couch in the living room has a compartment underneath it where I also keep blankets and towels. So I opened up that compartment and saw that there was another pillow that was in there. And once again, it looked like someone had poured some liquid in the middle of it because there's this huge stain in the middle of it. And then there was the highest concentration of white and green mold on this pillow. So somebody during Jim Pace's stay had decided to pour something on a pillow producing all this mold and then hide these things in places where you wouldn't see them. So when I went around looking at everything closely, I saw that the mold had gotten all over the whole house. And in some places, it looked like pieces of black junk on the wall. And in the kitchen, I noticed the same thing. And there were all these tiny black gnats, little tiny black flies all on the wall and ceiling of the kitchen. And I looked these up and they're called black mold flies. So these flies were eating the mold that was growing all over the house. So what I have since found out is that black mold is utilized by the US military as a biological weapon, as a bioweapon. And what I found is that there are certain methods to cause this to grow into people's houses. And as it continues to grow, it releases more mold spores in the air. So at a certain point, like during the winter, all you are breathing are these mold spores. That is the same as breathing a chemical. And this chemical attacks your respiratory system and it attacks your nervous system and it slowly kills you. And this is the same thing as when the military put smallpox on blankets that they would trade with the Native Americans. That was also a form of bio-warfare. The military has been doing this for a long time and they are using these methods more than ever before on their own civilians here in the US. So I have the whole story on a documentary entitled Mold Utilized as a Biological Weapon. And in this documentary, I explain the steps that you need to take to get rid of mold in the event that you find it growing in your house. And it took me a year to clean and sterilize everything in the house and figure out how to do this properly. So as I was cleaning the entire house, I remember taking these Hallmark greeting cards off of the shelf. And this was a card given to me by my grandfather. My grandfather is a World War II veteran. And this was the last card he was able to sign. And it had a picture of an angel on it. So when I went to go move all these cards to clean these shelves, I noticed that someone had picked their nose and rubbed a snot all over the back of this card. So Jim Pace is the type of character of a member of a secret society that is funded by the military to attack their own civilians. It is not enough to be invited into someone's house as a guest to be treated with courtesy and respect and then go around and place black mold all over the house that would surely kill them. That's not enough. He must also go and pick his nose and rub his snot on the back of an angel card signed by a World War II veteran and given to his grandson. I would like to point this out to some of you so that you can understand what you are dealing with. Many people, including military people or family members of military people will find it hard to believe that the military will employ their own to do things like this. Hopefully, the actions of men like Jim Pace will highlight the character of the type of people the military finds 
that will gladly take part in these operations that are in fact military war crimes and illegal actions against their own country. These people who are chosen to progress in these military secret societies are not regular men and women from normal families who have been brought up with morality and the understanding of justice who value our country. These people come from programs centered around child abuse, hatred, and mind control. These are the type of people who have always risen to power in corrupt militaries whose only goal is absolute greed, slavery for all mankind, and the destruction of everything else. So I did not say anything until the following spring when she was making plans to fly back out. So I made her a few videos on a channel that I marked private and to kind of show her the video evidence of everything with the black mold and what I had to do to get rid of it. And I believe that she watched the first video, but it upset her. And at that point, she just wanted to convince me that it was all coincidence, these things happening when Jim Pace was visiting, and I should just ignore it and allow him back into the house in the summer of 2019. But I said to her, under no condition do I want Jim Pace back in this house. The first year I let it go, a couple of these stupid pranks happened. I didn't make a big deal of it, and you said it probably wasn't him. And I listened to you, and he was invited back in. The same type of pranks happened, but this time caused black mold to spread all over the entire house. She was very upset, and she found every reason in the book to say there's no way that Jim Pace did this on purpose. It was me being paranoid. It was uh, somebody's sweaty head. She even said that there's no possible way that Jim could put a pillow up on a shelf because he had the hip replacement surgery. So I saw that it was just turning into arguments and my mother just yelling on the phone. It was one of the most frustrating things I've ever gone through. So I thought it would be a better idea to write down things in email so that we're not yelling at each other. And instead we're writing emails back and forth. So I said, we did it your way the first year. You said, I don't think it's him. I said, maybe you're right. And he was invited back in the house and something even worse happens. I spent the last year cleaning everything, cleaning all the mold off the house because of his last day. And there's no way I want him back in the house. So we argued back and forth and she never said, I agree with you. But the key was not to lose your temper with the people that you were trying to convince. As soon as you lose your temper and start yelling at the person or sound like you're getting desperate or out of control, that's when you start losing. And all the attention will go to you're being paranoid, listen to your voice, you're out of control, you're the crazy one, and it's you who is at fault and not him. That is what these military secret societies have found out from the start. If they pick on one person at a time while kissing everybody else's ass, the one person they pick on at a time, sooner or later, will look like the crazy one, making wild accusations and blaming these people who have done nothing but nice things for everyone else. This is what the U.S. military and all the huge militaries throughout history have learned about diplomacy, about infiltrating countries. They'll go in and kill off the strongest and most successful people in different countries and different regions. And then they kiss everybody else's butt so they go along with them. This is the U.S. military and the Roman Catholic Church's methods of infiltrating and subverting any type of country they enter, as long as they take over all the biggest corporations, all the strongest police departments, all the independent politicians, all the independent newspaper owners, as long as they're allowed to kill all those people, they'll kiss everybody else's ass who will be groomed to go along with them. They go after their targets and they leave everybody else alone. So, when you try to convince everybody who's being left alone, 
that there's some problem, they're not going to believe you. Because these are the people who have done them favors. These are the people who have given them jobs. So the best thing that you can do is to stay extremely calm. And you can let them rant. But maintain your point. Here's the photographs. Here's the video. This has only happened during their stay. Nothing bad happens ever when they're not here. And then for two years in a row, during their short stay, all these things go wrong. If this was a Matlock detective show, it would be obvious who the culprit was. The best thing to do is to state what happened and then maintain that point. Don't go on and on and on. Say, I am sorry that it's like this, but he has done this, not me. This is what he's done. This is how he's made it. I gave him one chance and he returned to the house to do something even worse. There's no way I am going to invite him back in for his next opportunity to do something wrong again. I would be a fool to do that. And they will go on and on and on. But it worked out due to the fact that I did not lose my temper. And I encouraged her to write her feelings down in an email that you could think about and then respond. That's the same way things are done in different cases. And in the court, people document their complaints, what proof they have, and why they think it's like that. And then when we got done writing a few emails, it made sense what I was saying. And her excuses and what she was saying looked kind of childlike. She did not have much of a defense for him. And I bet you the more she thought about it, the more she realized that this guy was capable of doing things like that. In the summer of 2019, Jim picked up my mom and brother from the airport. They went to Danbury. And then I met them halfway in Hartford at a diner. And I drove them back to New Hampshire. And when she wanted to go stay at Jim's house, once again, I met him in Hartford. And he drove them into Danbury. I was polite when I saw him. I said, hello, how are you? But I quickly turned away from him so that he would understand that I want no discussion about things. So once you've gotten someone out of your house, you do not want to listen to people saying you made your point, but let's give it another shot this upcoming summer. If you do that, basically you're saying, I am not to be taken serious. Everything I convinced you about or told you about, I don't really believe myself, and I'm willing to say I was wrong and want them to come back. When somebody faults you on the street, when someone you barely know does something crazy, most people cut them off instantly. I barely know them. They acted crazy. They did something crazy. I don't want anything more to do with that. But these secret societies have known that it is different when they begin to form personal relationships with you and your family. At that point, it gets very difficult to get them out of your house. But whenever she would bring this up, I would just remind her, that he's had a history of trying to sabotage things. My mother knew that Jim liked to spoil people's plans. And I just reminded her that by doing things like this, it's just another way to spoil or sabotage people's plans. When things go wrong, it's amusing to him. It's getting worse and worse to the point that he's done something that could potentially hurt and kill our family. And at that point, he's not allowed back into the house. So once you get these people out, never go back on your word or try to give them another chance. These people are pure scum. So if any of you have someone like Jim Pace in your house, I would recommend being your own media. This is exactly why the U.S. military wanted to kill all independent press. Because what that does is that it kills everybody's freedom of speech. It kills everybody's communication. Suddenly you've lost your voice to report the abuses of these people that are working for the U.S. military. So this is why the U.S. military has attacked all independent presses. So if you have an experience with someone like this who is acting crazy or doing crazy things, what you need to do is expose them and this will take away their power. A huge degree of their power lies in that people accept whatever they do and nobody stands up to them. The more you let them get away with and the less you do about it, the more power they have to do even more bad stuff. If you want to criticize Trump, 
He's up there acting stupid every day for everyone to criticize how terrible he is and how we should impeach him. So these scumbags that infiltrate your homes so they can put black mold on your house, they should be criticized just like Trump. So if this begins to happen to you, work up a case against them. Note down what happens, take photographs of this so that you have some proof to what you're saying. So it's just not you making a bunch of accusations against somebody. Work up a case against them. Make sure you take photographs and video of anything you may find or what you are going through and then make copies of that because that will put everything in perspective and they will have to take notice of everything that you went through.
Eliza, how are you doing? You're camouflaged in there. I'm really camouflaged in there. You did that yesterday too. You were eclipsed by Dorothy. <laughs> Oh my gosh, what is that? Oh, like oh no, that? she isn't. No, she isn't. Delicious. You really have a leash for that thing? Oh my gosh. Dylan, what are you doing? Love you, sweetie. So, what is this right here? Uh, for a second, I thought that was the food truck. Ah, I didn't even recognize. Is this Uncle Johnny here? I didn't even recognize you, sir. You lost a lot of weight. <laughs> Where's Michaela? Where did she go? Yeah, I brought water. Do we still need it? Hey, buddy, how are you? Excellent. Johnny, I didn't recognize you. How are you? I'm good. How are you? Good. It's been like 10 years. 10? More like 20. <laughs> How are you, sir? Good to see good. you. Good. Excellent. You good? Yeah, real good. Uh, I'm going to ask you, what is your brother's name? Bob. Have you seen Bob recently? Bob? Yeah, I saw him uh, about a week ago. Uh, the last oh, yeah. I heard, he was uh, uh, going out with a woman that used to live around here. Is he still with her? Or? Joanne? Joanne, right. Yeah. Yeah. How nice. And they live over in Clinton still or no? She's actually living in Ohio. He still has a house down in Clinton and then uh, he goes back and forth. Are they still together? Or? Oh, yeah. How nice. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, it's been a while. Excellent. Good to see you, Johnny. George, how are you? Hey. What are you up to? Um, the one issue I'm having though is Rachel told me that the timing belt was done right as uh, soon as we bought it. So wouldn't it didn't they didn't look at it. It didn't look at do you uh, have do you have it? Uh yeah, give me a couple minutes here. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I just got the tech isn't gonna be here for another hour. So. It didn't look at though, huh? No. No, it did, definitely didn't look. Because I would have uh, changed it if it looked at. I mean, once you get the, the, the cover, seemed like it had never been off. Right. Because two or three of the bolts were stripped, so you had to re tap those. Um. 
that's just to put the front cover on. Uh, so I can make a pretty good assumption that time belt wasn't done. Ha! Huh. Um, I'll have to go out and see if I can dig it out. Hopefully they didn't empty the trash last night. Okay. Um, all right, give me a couple minutes here. Thank you, I appreciate it. <clears throat> bad though huh I mean so I'm really unhappy with the other mechanic because we just brought or my uh, ex-wife brought Eliza's car into a guy named Cliffy I don't know if you know Cliffy he runs his own garage near Monadnack uh, his own garage near Monadnack uh, High School and uh, he let all that stuff go that you caught. Oh, you should have seen that ball joint. Oh my God. So that's why I don't want to uh, yeah. tell you anything other than thank you for catching all those things and making my daughter's car safe. I appreciate that. Yeah, I was actually kind of surprised that it was that bad. Yep. Yes, he called, Arnie called me out. Arnie Crowell is the one that worked on it. I don't know if you know Arnie or not. Okay. Um, He's an old timer. Yeah, that's pretty haggard on the outside. I mean, is there any way that you could give me a little bit of a break on that, sir? Um, some sort of discount on that, sir? Yeah, I'll give you. I'll, I'll, I'll take. I'm gonna. I planned on taking some money off anyway, sir. Ah, uh, thank you. Yeah. So. Um, That'll yeah. be great. It's Christmas time, and we don't have a lot of money. Oh so yeah, yeah. This is gonna be uh, her birth uh, Christmas present. So. Oh really? Yeah. That's what I did with my daughter. I picked her up an 08. In but it's not going to be a fun Christmas with nothing to unwrap. So <laughs> um, I was going over the list of all the cool things that we're going to do to her car. And yep. she told me, shut up. I don't want to hear it. I said, that's a bad attitude, young lady. Yeah. So she uh, was yeah. very unhappy about everything. and Probably another couple hundred miles of her driving back and forth. That's that noise she was hearing. I mean, seriously, the, you could take that wheel. And this, it surprised me that he missed it. But, I mean... Guys miss stuff. Yeah. You know, we miss stuff. Everybody misses stuff. But you could take that wheel and go clunk, 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 clunk. Wow. And Arnie called me up. He goes, hey, you got to come out and look at this thing. I'm like, oh, really? I was thinking, you know, I had a broken subframe or something like that. He said, no. He said, the ball joint, gone. I can, I, I, I just tried looking for that, too. Um, yeah, so. But I mean, he, he could have missed it. I mean, first thing you do when you jack the car up. You wiggle the wheels. I mean, that's that, that was that a complaint. normal thing. Right, right. A normal thing. Um, but I yeah. mean, I would have changed it. I, I would have changed it. Well, I appreciate you guys catching that. So uh, yeah. that was the complaint they had for him was that uh, it was making a noise when turning. So I don't <laughs> think he has much of an excuse other than, uh, well, you I know. He didn't charge her a hell of a lot. Yeah, I don't know. She got the invoice, yeah. and so uh, I told her, don't bring the trucks back or the cars back to this guy if he's going to do that type of work. So I mean, again, you know I mean? Guys miss stuff. I mean, I've, I've caught stuff that, like, even Greenlight Auto and a lot of the guys, I mean, and they've caught stuff that's like, hey, George, you know, this one had a slashed tire on the inside. Hello, how are you? We Good didn't catch you. it. You know, yeah. they, they, we didn't catch it. I mean, we people do miss stuff, but, um, yeah, I mean, it's, I, I would have changed that, definitely. Yeah, so it, it just seemed he didn't catch anything, so... No, no. This is something, I mean... May, may I? Oh, yeah. <clears throat> Careful, it's filthy rotten dirty. Yeah, that, uh, if you could give us a discount, you know, I, I would have uh, asked you not to change that since it looks pretty new, but uh, 800 is uh, kind of a hefty thing for this, so if you could make some money off, I'll really appreciate it. I'll do so. what I can. All right. Um, you know, again, a timing belt is something we rely on that... You know, has it been done? You know, I mean, you get in there, you pull everything off. I mean, yeah, it looks brand new to me, though. To be honest, nah, with you. I don't know if it's brand new, but but again, I mean, I you know, you don't know. I mean, it's it's you're in there. Yeah. Either you leave it or you put it all, put the alt in it, put everything back on it, and leave it. 
Um, but you've already broke the seal. Yeah. So I'll do what I can for you. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. No problem. Um, yeah. He's still got it down in the shop with the hood open. He's uh, got to button it up a little bit. Should be done okay. here pretty quick. Next couple hours. Okay. So. Um, yeah, I can give you a call, or you know, and let you know before anything happens. Before we button it up, I want to get it over. I want to clean it, and wash it. We clean okay, and wash great. it. We clean all right. wash the outside of it. So because you know, you get after you've done all kinds of stuff like that. Okay. Do you have any idea what type of discount we could expect? I mean, I can give you ten percent. You can't do twenty. I can't. I can't. Uh, I. I can't. Let, let me. Let me talk with Justin, um, and see what we can come up with. Can I? Um, that way, I can show him. Yeah. I can leave this in the back of the car for you. Oh, you can. I was yeah. going to uh, get a picture of that, but uh, if you leave in the back of the I'll car, I'll leave in the back of the car for you. Yeah. Excellent. Absolutely. All right. All right. All right, man. I'll a Cliffy, huh? I never heard of Cliffy. Um, Monadnock Auto. Uh, I think he does commercial, is what they were saying, so. Down by the high school. Oh. I know most everybody around that does it. Yeah, I don't know if he... We all talk with each other. He just know. might have his own shop, so. Yeah, probably. Uh, probably I'm, I'm a firm believer in running your own business, but not if you're going to do that, so. Yeah, I mean, you know, when a wheel's just about ready to fall off. Yeah. You don't want that. Especially as many miles she puts on. And she's driving it all the time.